My name is David Whitford. I'm at Baylor. Um, I, one moment of personal privilege, I would like to remind everyone here that the 16th century society has an active group of Calvin scholars and sessions every year. So please um, always think about the 16th century society as a venue for future papers. If anybody has questions about that, feel free to ask me. Our um, session today is on um, digital projects related to uh, the reformed wing of the Reformation. And I think my sense is that this will be two fairly um, brief presentations and then some more, basically I think workshopping makes some sense um, for what, what we will be doing and questions and answers around these two digital projects. I think I will introduce both of them now and then um, just let them move from one to the other and then we will hold all of the questions for the end. Does that work? Okay. Um, Jan Klok studied theology in Kampen and Munich. In 2019, he obtained his PhD at the University of Tübingen with a study of Bonaventure's commentary on the Gospel of Luke. In his research, he focuses on the one hand on the history of medieval exegesis and spirituality. On the other hand, he focuses on the history of the Reformation, focusing in particular on Calvin's sermons and letters. Amy Burnett is the Varner University Professor of History at the University of Nebraska, well known to this group for her work on the early Reformation, Basel, Bootser, and the Swiss Reformation. Um, I found this sort of an interesting little tidbit. Amy has a hat trick of presidencies. Having been the president of the 16th Century Society, the Kelvin Study Society, and the Society for Reformation Research, I'm not sure. I don't know if there's anyone else that has that hat trick, but I'm, that's quite kind of cool. Um, who's going first? Okay. John's going first. Thank you. Uh, Professor Mark for the opportunity to present here. Um, at first I have to uh, um, maybe disappoint you. It's not only on digital uh, humanities and digital pro projects, but also uh, printed uh, versions of uh, letters. So it's a, di uh, a hybrid project. Um, let's see if this works. Yes. Uh, I will short introduce you uh, my talk and then we go on. Um, I will present uh, my new project on Calvin's uh, correspondence. Uh, in the recent years, this uh, project has developed uh, and its, uh, sh its shape crystallized uh, at something more. So far, we, um, our first step and main object was to create a, a sustainable and solid basis for the project to, uh, to come to an end. That was the first step. The second step will be uh, the contents of the letters and the, uh, the content of the project itself. So, um, three objects, basically, uh, uh, building up a database of Calvin's letters uh, and the letters from him and to him. The second will be an addition of the letters and the third uh, objective of the project it will be a PhD project related to the correspondence of uh, Kelvin. Well, uh, my presentation will uh, first something on the background of the project, very short, then something about the structure of our project, and the last I will uh, elaborate on the three objectives shortly. The historical uh, background, well, the Dutch uh, relation to Kelvin is meant, and the United States is already mentioned sometimes, so this project of the letters is also some, to some extent a uh, Dutch tradition. Um, I will only recapitulate some, uh, some points, very short, and I'm sure many of the older members here uh, will know more about that than I do. Um, the first new start of the new edition of Calvin's letters was um, initiated by the late Heiko Oberman, who uh, got uh, this project on the letters of Calvin 
gave it an institutional place at the VU University in Amsterdam. The project led to the <coughs> publication of the first volume in 2005, made by uh, Frans van Stam and um, Cornelis Augustijn in collaboration with uh, Miriam van Veen, uh, amongst others. After uh, 2005, the work um, could not be continued and came to an, to an end. Since about a year of five, six, uh, Willem Balke, he is also, uh, we remembered him uh, in the beginning of the uh, conference, he came up with the idea to taking up this uh, important work anew, and um, the idea was already existed longer, but now with his vision and in initiative, it um, became more concrete. We discussed together many options and non-options, how to give this project new uh, form and to continue the work. The basic idea on the background was first uh, not only to create a new edition, but also to create a working environment which gives the project sustainability um, and the chance of being completed. Um, well, this has in a sense proved itself. Then uh, Willem Barker died in 21 and we could uh, pr proceed with the project and gave it its form to realize his idea. The structure of the idea, the project. Um, the first step was to establish a foundation to, um, under the name of Calvin's Reforming Correspondence. You see the header, that's the, the uh, how you say it in, in English, that, that you can uh, uh, see and um, recognize us. Um, the name is uh, something uh, ambiguous. On the one hand, it refers to Calvin and his contribution to the Reformation and the, the, the forming of the church uh, in Europe and abroad. On the other hand, the uh, name um, and the reference to correspondence can be seen in the context of the, the so-called Republic of Letters, referring to the um, intellectual community uh, from the 15th century to the 18th century, from learned uh, men and women who were in connection with each other by letters and other publications in early uh, modern and modern Europe. And particularly by the exchange of letters and books, they changed ideas how to form the society and to shape intellectual life from the 16th to the 19th century. In the 16th century, this was especially um, shaped by humanistic ideals uh, formulated by, amongst others, Erasmus. It's an interesting question to what extent the uh, correspondence of the reformers, like Bullinger or Calvin, belongs also to this Republic of Letters. That's the broader context and, uh, and uh, intellectual background of our project. The, um, the, the structure of the Foundation is in three parts, the board, scientific advisory board, and the institutional embedding. First, uh, the board, that, uh, the first the president is Frank van der Duin Schouten. He, um, he has been many years rector uh, of many universities in uh, the Netherlands, so he has many experience in uh, organizational uh, questions and um, also uh, regarding of uh, fundraising and foundation. Uh, Wim Moon, we all know, I don't see him at the time. Yeah, Wim Moon, you all know him. He is our secretary. And uh, Lydia Balke, the daughter of Wim, ba Wim Balke, is our treasurer, and myself, I'm the director. The, the sign on the, the, on the left above, that is uh, an, an uh, engraving made by the late wife of Professor Balke. And we may use it as, as our, um, in our header, so that's also a member of her. Um, the task of the board is the, the, the responsibility for uh, fundraising and the overview of the project as a whole. And uh, myself, I'm responsible for the day-to-day -day operations and the uh, execution of the project. Then the second is the, the academic advisory board. It's composed out of um, rep representatives of different um, disciplines in order to do justice to the multi um, 
disciplinary character of the project. Most of them are renowned skeleton specialists and have a lot of uh, work with uh, additional work. Um, most of them don't need any introduction, you know them better than I do. Uh, maybe Gianmarco Bragi is less known here. He is an um, Italian scholar and did his work on uh, Calvin and the French Reformation. Michael Bruning, Olivier Mien, <laughs> Peter Opis and Barbara Pitkin don't need introduction here. Um, Dirk van Meert, he is um, a specialist on digital humanities. He's director of the Dutch Academy of Sciences and he has um, teached many years at the University of Utrecht and he has many experience in digital editions uh, of Skelliger. He has made an edition uh, also. So, in principle, the board is, uh, is um, there will be a joint meeting of the board and the advisory board every year to, um, to present from our side what we've done and maybe ask for some uh, report uh, or advice. The third part of uh, the structure is the institutional embedding. That's basically the Theological University of Utrecht, in Utrecht. Um, there the project is now located and I um, have an appointment there which allows me to work on the project. Other partners, um, and I will explain later what they contribute, are uh, early modern letters online from, uh, from the UK. Foundation uh, of Religious Studies, Efskire in Italy, University of Modena in Italy, and which I already mentioned, the Dutch Academy of Sciences. That's both the uh, structure of, of the project. Then um, the uh, contents. I said the objectives, I, I said already, first the database, then the edition, and third the um, P, uh, PZ project. Um, Addition is, of course, the main objective of the um, project, but before we can do that, it's um, properly, to, we decided that it's proper to first publish a database of all letters from Kelvin and to Kelvin, to store that and make that visible and searchable in, a, in an orderly way. In the past, Van Stam already made a list of all the letters of Kelvin, but it's been lost the list, so that's really, really bad. So we had to do the work anew, and we do digital, so maybe it's more sustainable. Uh, what's important, uh, the conclusion of Van Stam was that the CO is reliable, and that there's uh, scarcely little additional material. There is, but not that much. Well, uh, who and where? Um, I'm working uh, at this uh, database <coughs> at this uh, moment. And I do this in combination with MLO in, in Oxford. And we, uh, the aim of this database is to um, make the, to describe the European-wide co correspondence from the 15th, 16th, 17th century. And put that all together and made it all searchable. To say it in their own words, and I quote, early modern letters online is a combined finding aid and editorial interface for basic descriptions of early modern correspondence, a collaboratively populated union catalog of 16th, 17th, and 18th, 18th century letters. So but the basic idea on the background is to put Calvin's uh, correspondence in the uh, context and that network of the, the letter correspondence of the 15th, 17th, uh, 16th and 17th century. Well, how we do it? Um, I use a standard MLO uh, spreadsheet to put all the metadata of the letters in it, uh, such as the date, the sender, the recipient, the place of sender, place of recipient, the incipits of all the letters and all the archives where the different manuscripts can be found. And we discussed earlier, we can also um, put much information in it, just what we want and what we want to see the public. Uh, meanwhile, the first 200 letters I put in the database, um, and that enables us uh, to signalize already problems with some letters, or clear uh, things which are clear or not clear. And you can so building up this database, you can find the research moments for every letter. And also, it's um, interesting to see that many archives 
uh, are not very correct in uh, describing the manuscript you can find online. So many dates are missing or wrong. Um, so many um, letters which are stored by example, the third calendars of, uh, of May, then they say uh, 3 May. They don't uh, <laughs> recognize what's, what's there. So that's an interesting uh, observation. Uh, next to this uh, database, I built up a digital uh, archive in which I collect all the, um, the, the PDF files or picture files of all the letters stored by a letter. So that um, gives uh, an uh, a research environment where you have all the information together which make the work on the addition later more easy because the information is there and it's also for other persons available. Um, MLO is, uh, is, is a wonderful construction. There's um, for especially also for the Reformation letters to put in there. They have already about 200,000 letters in the database. So that's really a massive and they also want um, more letters in it, so that gives a real research structure with in very interesting options. Uh, one of the options is and, uh, the database I make, I may also use in connection with the Dutch Academy of Sciences. They also have built an epistolarium uh, um, where they collected many letters from the Dutch context. And they are very interested to put Kelvin also in this uh, database because he has many connections to, to uh, the Dutch history and uh, that delivers many, much information and builds up uh, even more information. They also want to put the correspondence of Erasmus into this uh, new database. So this is a new, also a new project and a new uh, opportunities for research. I hope to finish the, the work on the database in end 2024. And it's, it's not, I'm not sure if it's realistic, but you have to have a goal. Uh, then the th second part of the, uh, the project is the edition itself. As I said, by creating this database and information uh, of all the letters, um, we have a research um, environment to make the work on the edition more easy. The ideal is to, uh, to create a team to make an edition. You can do that work alone and then to discuss every letter within this context of other researchers. And um, the best option is to have many research from different disciplines, so the theological, historical, philological, and so on. The, the, all, the, all those aspects are coming together in, this, uh, in a letter, so you need to, uh, to recognize that and to, um, to uh, give that space in the work and the, on the letters. Um, the output is um, a hybrid edition, so both a digital and a printed version. The great advantage of a printed version is not only that you have a book in your hand, which we as historians and theologians also do like, um, but at the same time a book has something of uh, eternal value, which is unknown in the digital world. When there's just one copy of a book in one library, it exists. And that's not difficult to imagine, that just one library has one book. Um, it, uh, it exists and it needs hardly any uh, maintenance or costs. However, a digital material needs um, maintenance and it's always, it costs a lot of money to, to hold this hold this on and make it visible and usable for the public. Yet it's precisely the digital publication of the letters which is important. Because in many cases, at least in Europe, it's um, a kind of academic duty to publish uh, scientific material online and mostly open, on an open access. So things must be free available. But also, um, next to the duty, the, the, the digital publication makes um, countless additional possibilities in searching, uh, in text mining, philological analysis, and you name it. You can all things make searchable within those uh, digital publications. 
So therefore, it's very um, significant to publish the letters also digital. The technical realization of this part of the project will be uh, the, the, in, with the connection with the KNRW, the Dutch Academy of Sciences, who have many experience in publishing uh, digital books and projects. Then the last, and then uh, I will close. We have uh, in mind a, a, a PhD project to stimulate also scientific research, not only to uh, the addition of the letters, but also thematic uh, research to the uh, items connected to the correspondence. We, um, with regard to the theme of this research, we, uh, we, um, we have a broad title, The Significance of Calvin's Strasbourg Correspondence for the Understanding of the Theological, Pastoral, and Educational and Development. So that's basically for the start of the project now, which starts in September uh, 1538. Um, later we can maybe add another uh, general title for this PG project. And of course, this title needs further specification uh, considering the angle of research, which can be uh, philological, theological, or historical, or just what the PhD student wants to research. Um, the aim is to make this uh, project as, um, in the form of a joint doctorate, together a uh, um, cooperation of the University of Kampen Utrecht and the University of uh, Modena in Bologna, with, um, so that's uh, the idea. The fundraising for this is uh, the, the responsibility of the, the, our foundation and uh, together with Afskire and, and Dresd in Italy. And we are um, making um, quite uh, an advance. Uh, we have uh, uh, got some money for that to realize it. And we plan to start this project in 2024. Uh, and the output of this is, of course, the dissertation. Well, um, that was, in short, um, the project as how I wanted to present it. Thank you for your attention. Again, I also want to thank Corrine for this opportunity to give this presentation. Um, I should say one of the things about COVID, many of the problems of COVID, is that it really hurts scholarly communication. And I, what I wanted to do today is make known to you and show you some of the strengths of a couple digital projects that are being done in Germany and in Switzerland, so in, in German-speaking areas, but I think they are incredibly valuable for anyone working on Calvin and Calvinism. Um, the two projects, if I can figure out how this works. Oops, did I just turn it off? There we go. Okay. Um, the, the two projects, the, the first one, Bullinger Digital, which makes available the surviving correspondence of the Zurich reformer uh, Heinrich Bullinger, and the project Theologian's Correspondence in the Southwest of the Empire in the Early Modern Period, will ultimately index and edit all of the correspondence of theologians working in Heidelberg, Tübingen, and Strasbourg between the years 1550 and 1620. On the surface, both of these projects are similar. Their goal is to make available a body of letters written by reformers in the 16th century to scholars all over the world. But they differ significantly in their origin, in their goals, and in their scope. And so what I want to do today is talk a little bit about these proposals or these projects, comparing their different approaches to the digitalization of early modern correspondence, and in the process talk a little bit about the strengths and the weaknesses. And I hope to make them make them known to you so that you can use them. And because they both involve databases, I can ultimately say that the best way to learn about these projects is to go into the websites and play with them yourselves. But I wanted to show you a little bit about how the websites work so that it makes it a little bit easier. So to begin with the Bullinger Digital Project, um, the project's based at the University of Zurich, and its goal is to digitize, transcribe, and translate into German the letters written to or from Heinrich Bullinger. It's a project that began in 2020, just before the COVID pandemic hit, and the first phase was completed in 2022. There is now a request for funding for a, a second phase um, that was being prepared in the spring. 
Bullinger Dig Digital was created in response to, I think, what can only be called a crisis in funding for the print edition of the critical edition of Bullinger's correspondence. Um, little bit of background with slightly more than 12,000 letters. Bullinger's correspondence is one of the largest that we have from the first half of the, of the 16th century. For the sake of comparison, uh, the cor surviving correspondence of Luther, Calvin, and Erasmus all lies somewhere between 3,000 and 3,500 letters. There are about 7,000 letters in Loyola's, uh, Ignatius of Loyola's correspondence, and Melanchthon's correspondence is about 9,000 letters. So Bullinger is bigger than all of those, and the fact that so much of this is surprised, uh, has survived is due to the fact that Bullinger, bless his heart, was a frustrated historian and a pack rat. Um, something like 80% of the letters are preserved in Zurich, in the Zurich Staatsarchiv or the Zentralbibliothek. Uh, they are letters to Bullinger rather than from Bullinger. Um, the importance of this correspondence has been recognized, long recognized, already at the beginning of the 20th century. There were efforts to publish a critical edition. Um, Swiss scholars gathered all of the notes and the information on the original location, the uh, metadata, who's it to from, dates, and all of that kind of stuff. And it was all kept on a card catalog in the theology faculty and in the Institute for the History of the Swiss Reformation in Zurich. And then beginning in 1972, 1973, um, the critical edition of this work started coming out. And volume 20 was published in uh, 2022. Uh, it brings the critical edition up to letter 3101 um, through the end of 1547. And that's where the problems came in. Because the Swiss government changed its funding mechanisms, there is no longer any possibility of getting funding for a long-term project like this. Obviously, it takes 50 years to produce 20 volumes. This is a, and we're only a third, I'm only a quarter of the way through. Um, this is obviously a serious issue. How do you get funding? Well, the team at the Institute for the uh, Rest for Swiss Reformation History looked for support. Uh, one of the first things they did was also to create a foundation. So if any of you have any money to give to support the funding of Bullinger's uh, or correspondence, here's the website. Um, but obviously that is a very slow and long and inadequate way of supporting such a significant project. So they also sent out a call through the University of Zurich to anyone working on digital projects and with computer technology and were responded to by, of all places, the Department of Computer Linguistics, or Computational Linguistics. Um, Professor Dr. Martin Folk was the one who took up the challenge of making Bullinger's correspondence accessible on the web. Uh, as an aside, I should say here, computational linguistics, which I did not realize, this is the department that is involved, or the, the, the field that works with the development of artificial intelligence and chat GPT and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so they are very interested in issues of the analysis of uh, written texts and the spoken word. Um, so with funding from the University of Zurich, uh, Professor Wolf led a team of his own postdocs and graduate students, and he worked in collaboration with people in computational linguistics from other uh, institutions in Germany and Switzerland to create Bullinger Digital. Now, th this is an important point. The team kept in contact with Peter Opitz at the Institute for Swiss Reformation History, and Peter is now retired, and I should say he's very sorry he couldn't be here, but he had family issues. Um, but the project was funded within the computational linguistics department. It's focused on the technical problems of digitizing 16th century texts and manuscripts rather than on the historical context or the historical content of the letters themselves. They, in, in one sense, the content is completely irrelevant. They could just as well work with medieval manuscripts or, say, scientific manuscripts of the 16th century. So, with that in line, the first goal of the project was to improve the automatic transcription of manuscripts, uh, working with an existing program called Transcribus. Uh, early modern letters, as you may know, pose all sorts of problems for automatic character recognition because of differences uh, between shifting back and forth between Latin and German, uh, idiosyncratic spelling of words in whatever language you're using, the difficulty of training a computer to recognize handwriting in general, especially when you have very limited chunks of text. Um, and so there continues to be some debate about this, but I have to say I have become a convert to the value of these kinds of automatic transcriptions with some caveats, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and then the second goal of this project is to improve the ability to translate from 
Latin into modern German, and I'll talk more about that. In, in both cases, however, the project team has essentially trained the computer programs to produce accurate transcriptions and translations of Bullinger's correspondence, or at least that, that was their goal. And I stress these two goals because I think they're relevant for users of the database. If you look at the publications that have resulted from the project, you'll see they all involve the technical aspects of making early modern manuscripts available. Um, they're written by computer scientists rather than by historians, and I will say that the people involved in this project have learned a good deal about early modern life, um, but as I said, the content of the letters is really of only secondary interest. Um, and in this case, Bullinger's correspondence can be seen of as a tool for developments in the field of computational linguistics rather than a focus of study in their own right. At any rate, the end result of this project is a tremendously important for both historians and theologians. It is an online searchable database of Bullinger's correspondence, both those letters that are published in the critical edition and those that have not yet been published. Um, over the course of this two-year project, they worked with the uh, state Library and, or the State Archive and the Central Library in order to digitize something like 8,000 letters to make them available on the website. And these are available then with transcriptions and German translation. And so rather than working with the website, which never works when you're trying to make a presentation, I've made a bunch of screenshots to show you how this all works. Um, Bullinger Digital provides several different ways of approaching Bullinger's correspondence. The most important is the tabular overview, and if you look at the top, you can see that there are, you can show tables either by the date, the correspondent, the institution, so for instance, the Zurich consistory, uh, groups, uh, places, the archive where the original is located, literature, that's the published, uh, where the published version is found in the HBBW number, it cross-references it to the letters in the critical edition, the letters that have already been published up through um, 1547. I have this as an example, I, I chose you, there are two letters from 1523, you can click on 1523 and it'll bring up the two letters. You can also search by, as I said, by place and, and so on. Um, Next table, the other uh, alternative you have is you can look at a map, and this is the overall view of where these letters are sent to or, to or from, uh, which is why there's so many of them in Surish. Um, this map is actually clickable so that if you print on, well, the, one, the example that I have, 277 letters sent to all of England, you click on that and you can see, in fact, there's 146 to the London area. It will move down as you, as you zoom in so that you can see how many letters there are on each location. Okay, I wanna give you two examples of the kinds of data of letters that are in the database. For the first one of, of edited letters, books that, that, that are already in HBBW, and uh, that's this one here. This is the very last one in the volume 20, uh, uh, Joachim Varian to Bullinger from the end of 1547. So you see the website gives all the meta metadata, the, the date that it's sent, uh, the sender and the recipient, where it's sent to, where it's from, where you can find the location, and it gives the volume number of HBBW, and then it has the request or the summary that is in the printed correspondence at the head of the, at the, of, the, of the letter. If you scroll down this page, you come to the digitized text and a transcription of the text. Um, I should notice it says, show the footnotes. These are the footnotes that are in the critical edition. So this is basically making the critical edition available um, with the text, uh, the, the a, dig, a scan of the original so that you can see what the handwriting looks like, but it is the edited letter. Um, what's, I think, more useful, well, I mean, the, the, we have the critical, the printed critical edition. What is particularly important is the availability of letters that are not available, that have not been published, all of those that are sitting right now in, in the Zurich, um, city archive, or the city state archive. And here I have an example of a letter from Johannes Haller from Bern to Bullinger. And here you see the metadata is the same. Uh, here it gives the incipit, the first line, but there is no summary of contents. Um, if you scroll down again, you find the facsimile of the, the transcription and, or the, the, yeah, the, the scan and the transcription. Um, 
couple things to point out at the top, and I don't know how to make the little red light come on because I'm incompetent techn technologically, um, but you have two options at the top. Uh, Sprache markieren, that means if you hit on that, if the letter is in, say, German and Latin, the Latin will be yellow and the German will be green. So you can tell at a glance how much of the letter is in which language. I didn't do it with this one because this letter is entirely Latin. Um, then the Übersetzen, you can translate the letter. It will be automatically translated. Now, the translation takes a while. This is a fairly short letter of only 250 words, if I recall correctly, and it took a while for it to translate, but um, 230 words. This is what it looks like, the translation. And this is where we start to run into the, the devils in the details. Um, they told me that the error rate of the both the transcription and the translation, especially the, the error rate is higher for the translation than the transcription, but the error rate lies between 5 and 10 percent, which, you know, that's, that's, that's pretty good. 90 percent of it is correct until you stop and think, well, 5 percent of, of, 5 percent error means one word in every 20 is wrong. Um, and so you have to use these things with, well, looking back at the transcription and, and, and comparing, it, comparing it to the digitized scan itself. Now, I will be first to admit that my error rate in transcribing anything is probably higher than 5 or 10%, so I very much appreciate the machine transcription, um, but you need to be aware of that. What's perhaps more of an issue for those of you who read German and want to look at the German translation is the problem of the errors in the translation, and here I point to the line up here where it says, Librum quem hum his literis mito ad if you look over here, das Buch, das ich mit diesen Briefen senden, hat mich Viretus geschickt. Then we have the problem. Uh, opus tuum est de origine erroris in linguam Gallicum versum et Geneve impressum. Uh, the computer didn't know what to do with the name of the book. De, uh, de, yeah, and, and it translates, it said, Dein, your, your work is the origin of errors in the French version, and, and it just it doesn't even know what to do with Geneva. So you can't take the translation. You have to use a little bit of caution, but that's why we have minds. <laughs> this, is why we, this is why humans are better than artificial intelligence. Um, but I still, I think this is a tremendous improvement, and I will say they did point out a few errors in, in the transcriptions in the printed volumes. So in some cases, the machine has done better than humans. Um, and when I was there, ChatGPT had just come out, and they were talking a lot about how accurate ChatGPT was in doing the translation. So it, it's really quite interesting to see the implications of this new technology for scholarship. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about the search function. First off, this is a German database. That doesn't mean you need to know German, but it does mean that the search terms are in German, or you, you can use Latin. And I should emphasize, this is a keyword search. It is not an index. That's uh, an important point. You can put in any word, and something will come up. Um, you get different searches. You get different results if you type in the Latin word sacramentum, versus the German word sacrament. And this goes back to what is being searched. The default is that it will search basically the, the, the letter text, the heading, the summary. Um, so if the letter is in German, or if the letter is in Latin, sacramentum, and the word sacramentum is in the letter, it'll show up. Um, if there's no summary in German and you type in the German word, the letter won't come up. So you have to be aware of the, uh, of the the language. Um, locations you have to treat a little bit differently. If you're looking for, say, Geneva being mentioned in the text, you can type in Geneva under the, the concept, begriff, uh, uh, the, the topic, keyword, but if you want to know where the letter is sent from or sent to, you have to use the Ortschaft, the place, um, in order to find uh, where the letter, the, the, basically the metadata for the, the letter. Um, you can also search by date, and you have the choice of giving in a range. Uh, you can be just give a, a particular year or a particular year and month, or you have the specific date in mind. For the correspondent, you can just put in, uh, you can put in, no, specify either sender, recipient, or either one. Um, language, this picks up on that, that language distinction. If you're looking for a letter that is, say, 50% in French, and you can change the proportion, you're looking for something that's 10% in French, or Italian, or Greek, or whatever. Signature, where it's originally found, or um, Ortschaft, um, yeah, that's the place sent to or from, if it is already published in the critical edition. 
things that are useful to know. Uh, if you are wanting to truncate a word, which is really useful if you're looking for anything in Latin, like the name for Geneva, you can use the tilde, uh, and it'll come up with any form of the word. If you look up at the top, that keyboard icon up there uh, to the top, on the top right, on the left-hand side, that will allow you to search for early modern diphthongs, so an A with an E over it, things you can't easily type on your computer. Um, the wheel, if you pull that down, there's a pull-down menu that will let you specify where you want the word to be found that you're looking for. So if you only want something in the transcription or you only want it in the index or the summary or in the, the place where it said, you can specify what's going to be searched. As I said, the default is all of them. And last but not least at all, every time you want to start a new search, you have to remember to hit Sulexetson to reset because it will not automatically reset. Okay, so I'll, you can have questions about this at, at the end, but I want to move on and talk about the theologians' correspondence. Um, this is a project that is based at the University of Heidelberg. It is, in contrast to the, the Bullinger Digital, which I like to call a short, sweet, and dirty, this is a long-range project. It's funded by the Heidelberg Akademie der Wissenschaften for a 15-year project for multi-mega million euros. I mean, this is the amount of funding that Americans can only dream about. Um, and its goal is all of the correspondence written between 1550 and 1620 by theologians active in these three cities. Uh, it's directed by Professor Dr. Christoph Strom, and it employs a full-time team, interdisciplinary team, of church historians, classicists, digital humanist specialists, uh, doctoral students, and student assistants. They've got eight full-time spots and three part-time spots. So this is a, a huge project. The editors who came into this have lots of experience in critical editing. They worked beforehand on Martin Bootser's uh, Deutsche Schriften, on the, the final volumes of Zeling's Church Ordinance uh, series. Uh, one of them was had some experience with the Bullinger correspondence. Uh, and their approach is much more like a, a traditional critical edition, but with an integrated digital course, uh, digital component. So the scope of the project is a little misleading if you look at the rather clunky title. Uh, its focus is roughly, 100, roughly 200 people, 190 individuals, who were located in these cities either as professors or court preachers or superintendents or high church positions. So this, 190, this core of 190 men, and then those people that they corresponded with, um, as a result, it's over 2,000 people in par as part of this network, and they think when the whole thing is done, they will have roughly uh, 30,000 letters. So this is a huge uh, database, or it will be when it, when it is finished. Um, the chronological limits are also broader than you might think, because it's not cut off dates at 1550 and 1620. They have the entire correspondence for men who are active during this period. So the most important example for this is someone like Johannes Brentz, who became the head of the, basically the leader of the Württemberg Church after the Schmalkaldic War, but had a significant career as a Lutheran reformer in uh, Schwäbisch Hall before the Schmalkaldic War, and all of his correspondence will be included as part of this project. Uh, likewise, it's not just people who are located, who, who, were, who were at these three cities for a long period of time, it's anyone who was ever active. And so if you know anything about Heidelberg, you know that there are a lot of Swiss who ended up in Heidelberg, including one of my favorites, Johann Jakob uh, Grineus of Basel, uh, was a professor in Heidelberg for two years and then went back and spent the next 30 years of his life as head of the at Basel Church. So all of Grineus's correspondence is also available. Uh, there are a number of other Swiss who are prominent, uh, well, and there are obviously close ties between this and the Bollinger Digital Project. Um, putting this together is a mind-boggling task, especially in comparison to the Bollinger Project where they had that wonderful card catalog that they could work with that had been built over 100 years. This was a case where the scholars had to basically sit down and do searches in archives and libraries everywhere throughout Europe, uh, making archival visits. It did not help that COVID shut everything down, um, and it's kind of amazing that they've been able to do what they have uh, already. Uh, so, as I said, the first task was just to go out and find these letters, for starters, and then to obtain copies of them. Um, all told, they will eventually have, and I, I should say, this is a, a 
with all this, this many letters, you can't just say we're going edit to edit all of them. So the project is envisioned to have four different layers of making them known. First off, everything's going to be in the database, at least at the level of meta metadata, so you know uh, that the letter exists and you can find it. Um, about a third of the letters will also have a digitized version online uh, with the transcription provided by the editorial team, so human transcription rather than machine transcription. And about a thousand of the letters will be also fully edited online with the regular editorial apparatus annotations. And the selection of, I mean, you know, how do you pick out of 30,000 letters? Well, the grant that was, uh, as it was specified, said the main interest points are the issues of secularization, confessionalization, and the formation of the territorial state. So those are the criteria used to determine what are the most important letters. And then out of, uh, in, in addition to these, well, we've, we've moved from 30,000 to 10,000 to 1,000. Uh, the last part of this project, about 800 of the letters will be printed in a critical edition of the, those considered to be most important for these three processes in a series of six volumes, two of them already in print. Um, basically, each of them goes up to about 1570, 1580. So the first half and the second half, uh, the volumes for Württemberg and uh, Heidelberg have been published. They're working on Strasbourg now. Each of these volumes has about 100 120 uh, letters in them, fully annotated and available. Okay, so to look more specifically at the interface, um, I should say uh, up in the corner you can switch between German and English, so at least you can look at the interface in English, but all the data itself is in German, which again is going to make a difference when it comes down to, to search terms. Um, Oh, I should say something. I, the, the, the letter of the month is really kind of fun. Every month, the editors pick out a letter that they find is really interesting. And if you click on that, it'll tell you about the, this, this, this particular letter looks at dreams that are mentioned in letters. Uh, they've had ones talking about earthquakes and other natural disasters. So it's kind of fun. And you can actually get on the mailing list to have these sent to you once a month. Um, you can find out more about the project. And then there are these four different kinds of searches that you can that you can do. So, to start out, oops, wrong button. Okay, um, yeah, this is what the database looks like once you've gone in and done a search. And here, up here, I picked a letter of Tassanus to Calvin. Um, right now, they've got about eleven thousand letters in the database, so that's about the same size as Bullinger Digital. Um, roughly ten thousand of these fall into the, the category. They, they started with the easiest ones, the letters that are already printed. Um, and so you can find out in this case the letter is in CO, the original is in Geneva. Um, and then down here, uh, and I should say yes, there is, there, uh, that, yeah, mention those that were Bullinger involved with, there is a link to the Bullinger digital website. Down here you have the index terms, uh, by person, place, and topic. And this is what makes this database so powerful because it is indexed. It's not just a keyword search. Um, okay. You can do a keyword search. That's perfectly possible. This is the original interface. If you go to simple mode, it'll come up here and you get the free search. Uh, and you type in the word that you want and anything will come up. In that sense, it's like it works like uh, Bullinger Digital. But, as I said, the power lies in the indexing whether you want to look at the letters, persons, places, or subjects. And the best way of thinking about this really is like four different indexes that are cross-referenced. Um, in computer terms, it's four different related databases. One for the letters, one for the people involved, one for the places, and one by subject. So to walk you through, the letters is probably the most important, the one that's most used. It uh, will find all of the letters that meet the search criteria. You can add search criteria by clicking on the plus sign up there. Um, it's German, so you have to use Johannes Calvin rather than Jean Calvin um, or John Calvin. And as with Bullinger, Bullinger Digital, every time you want to use a new search, you have to hit the reset um, button to clear all the stuff that you have. There is a drop-down menu for each of these the, the, for the first field. In this case, as an example, I'm showing the, the recipient or the one to whom the letter is addressed is one field, uh, and the language, say I wanted to specify I wanted the letter to be in French. Um, 
and again, you can search by years. Important, you have to use, pay attention to capitalization. It's not gonna, if you're gonna be lazy and write in uh, Johannes Calvin as I sometimes do without bothering to capitalize, I'm not gonna get anything. So names especially have to be capitalized. Um, you can keep adding criteria. There are a number of different criteria that you can use for the pull down. Um, and again, as with Bullinger Digital, there is a distinction between places that are topics mentioned in the letter and places from which letters are sent or received. Um, persons provides information on the sellers and on the, on, the, on the individuals involved, and it will pop up specific mentions. So in this case, uh, doing a search on Johannes Calvin, basic life dates, uh, there are 36 letters from Calvin, uh, 60 to him, and he's mentioned in a further 132 letters. Again, this is not a complete, the, the database is not complete, but this at least shows you right away we've got Calvin mentioned in a number of letters. And you, as with the, uh, the letters portion, you can add different criteria to, you, know, you want to find letters from John Calvin written between 1560 and 1564, for instance. Um, places, uh, again, you can use this as a, a free text and just type in the name of a place, or you can specify in this place I put in a K and it'll autofill and give you a selection. Do you want a church, a kirche, a cluster, a continent, and pick one of those and it'll come off, you can, it'll be more specific. And why that's important is because I did a search on Strasbourg and you can see Strasbourg has a number of different levels. Am I just talking about the city or am I talking about any of the particular churches or uh, places within the hospital? And again, uh, German rather than French or English, you get far more searches if you use the German name for the city than for the, uh, the English or the French version. Um, subjects, you can type in any subject, again, in German. This is really a fascinating uh, feature because the level of indexing is so granular. Um, so if you type in Cronkite or sickness, I got, you, you get the 22 subtopics under the general heading of Cronkite, including things that don't have the word illness or Cronkite in them. I mean, my favorite was plague in Zurich. Um, so related terms. So this is an incredibly powerful search engine. This is also why it's taking them so long to go through um, and, and create this database. Um, so, very quickly, to kind of sum up, if you want to compare the two of them, uh, quick, dirty, cheap, and effective, uh, expensive, long-term, incredibly valuable. Um, indexing is basic versus very detailed indexing. Uh, transcriptions are really useful but not completely accurate, whereas the, the Heidelberg Project has, has lived up to the highest standards of German critical editing. Uh, one is essentially done, the other is going to take another, uh, not quite a decade to finish. But that being said, well, I guess maybe the best way to think about it is that this is like going into an archive and finding the letter. This is like having a modern critical edition of it. Both of them have value, especially for those of us who don't live in Europe. Um, these databases make these correspondence available. You don't need to be fluent in German to use them. Obviously, the letters, most of them are in, are in Latin, um, and you can search for them. If you have a few basic terms in German, you can do the search. Um, ultimately, I think they are really valuable because they both of them index letters to and from Calvin, which, you know, not available in the CO. But they're also useful sources of information on the church in Geneva and on the impact of the Genevan Reformation, especially in German-speaking territories. And I should say, this does not mean all of those letters are in Germany. As you saw from the map, the letters are all over. Um, actually, I guess I didn't have the map on this one. Um, but I think both of these databases are extremely valuable for people who are working on I'll just say the reform tradition more broadly in the second half of the 16th and early 17th century. And with that, I want to end the, my presentation, but I do have the databases up on the, a website, so if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them, and if Jan wants to, has, he can answer questions too. <laughs> if we have time. <laughs>
We, we do have a few minutes for some questions uh, and general uh, excitement about <laughs> s stuff like this. Uh, um, I work on he who must not be named and um, <laughs> the, the, the Luther's Werk in, in digital format is magnificent. Max. Yes, thank you very much for both uh, presentation. I have many, many questions as scholar, as editor, and as publisher. But I keep all, we can, we, we can speak about that. But one uh, question to you, Amy, and one to you. Uh, uh, you show us uh, some letters from Vadian to Bullinger. But Bullinger scripture, I, I know it. It's not so easy. Uh, and uh, Bootser is worst. And with Bullinger, you have only line on the line. And the T or the D is just something a little, uh, uh, um, a little point yeah. just under the line. So I, I needed time just to, to, uh, uh, to learn Bollinger scripture, and after that, to read it, to transcribe. Yeah. So uh, it's difficult for uh, a scanner to recognize. And why do you not add a picture of each letters? So you have the picture. You have the transcription and the translation, but you can always, if you do not trust the translation, to come back to the original without to go to uh, Zurich or to uh, Heidelberg or in Strasbourg, everywhere. So just a question of a picture. The second question for you about the Calvin correspondence, it's, uh, we have a little, bo lit uh, a little uh, bit more than 5,000 uh, letters Calvin. And uh, it's uh, the, the annotation, because you can uh, use chat GPT or something like that, but it's impossible to do an annotation with a chat GPT, to recognize, to give the connection between uh, men. And, and uh, so, what uh, sort of annotation do you want to add to your uh, edition of the Calvin correspondence? I'll answer real quickly about the, the Bullinger Digital. Those scans can be increased so that you can, you can zoom in on particular words and phrases. Um, so in, in that sense, I mean, it, it, is almost an improvement to actually looking at the original in Zurich, which I can't afford to do, quite honestly. <laughs> um, it makes it available, and as I said, their transcription rate is far higher than what mine would be if I tried to read Bullinger's completely illegible handwriting. So in that sense, it, it's an improvement on what we have existing. I mean, there are things we might want to be better, but from my perspective, this it's a game changer for the kind of things that are available for me. Uh, Chat GPT is for me n new, so I haven't worked with that. Um, but considering the annotation, uh, I think it'll, uh, it's, it's a choice if you make such a rich one as Van Stam did, or you uh, more the essentials uh, um, like uh, the Bullinger or the, the Melanchthon uh, edition. So, I suppose it will be a way uh, in the midst of that, but there will be uh, old-fashioned handwork, I think, and not by using an... But maybe there are some new insights on that. And, but the idea now is to, to, do it by, to do it itself, and not by chat GPT or... No. And also a picture of the manuscript? That would be the ideal, yes. I'm, I'm not sure about the rights of that, if all are free to use, but yes, the idea is to... The idea is to add a picture of the yes, manuscript, yes. of old manuscript. Just like the Bullinger and... Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Other... 
Yeah, we have time for one more question, maybe. <laughs> well, oh, yeah. Bruce. Oh, thanks. <clears throat> with uh, two two short questions, one with the translation that it generates on the on the bilingual. Has that translation been controlled, or do you have to look yourself to make sure that it's not? Uh, you have to look yourself. So they take no responsibility for the No, time. it's <laughs> simply, <laughs> yeah, this is, this is, these are computer scientists. Right. They right. are not historians, right. Right. so you have so, to. So they'll, they'll shoot it up on the screen, but you take Well, it, yeah, I mean, it's done automatically. Yeah, it, that yeah. translation That's is right. done when you press right. on the button. That's so they right. can't really take responsibility for the accuracy. Right. And the other question is, um, I'm thinking of the Jonathan Edwards project, in, which has similar things in, in open access. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the things they do, which is very important, is, is both projects are kind of in conversation with their readers or with their users. Um, a large part of the project is evolving often out of reader response mm -hmm. or user response. I didn't really hear anything. Are these, are your, is your project, for instance, going to be interactive with a reading public? Or is it, or is it you know, simply, uh, of course it's not simply, but, it's, but is it, Presenting this material, I think so is it? Are, do you envisage a, a kind of um, way in which scholars, wherever they are in the world, can interact with you as as leading this project? Um, you you mean, uh, the the end product will not be well, this this uh, the, just the, the, just to the end is you know the project as it, as it will continue over a period of time. Yep. Is it something that? People who are scholars sitting in Nebraska or sitting in, you know, uh, Vermont or you know whatever can actually interact with your project in in ways. Give yes, of course, fee you, you, feedback or, yes, or yes, is yes. it? it, it and and because I didn't get the sense with the Bullinger one whether it's very no. And again, this is why it's important to remember that this is a tool. This is something where computer linguist people in computational linguistics are working on this project, and they are not. They're not doing this as historians. And so I don't think there's any way for there to be any input. I mean, I think informally, if you wanted to email them and say, I've got a question about this, they'd welcome it. But I don't know of any formal way, because that's, that's not their concern. Right. And that's why I think it's Which important to keep that. Project, yeah. that feedback is an essential part of how the project has developed. Yeah. As yeah. As yeah, well, I and I think that has to do with the difference in the funding situations between mm -hmm. the U.S. and Europe. And then I will say the other thing about the Heidelberg Project, this is a very German top-down project with all the money coming from above, and they are on very strict deadlines to report back. So I don't think they're terribly interested in any kind, well, honestly, they don't necessarily need reader feedback because they've got experts that are working on it. Uh, I mean, they'd, again, I think they'd appreciate informal correspondence, but that's not a part of the project. They are working on this very much in the same way that the critical edition, say, of Bullinger was produced up until this point, or the critical edition of Melanchthon is being produced, or the critical edition of, of whoever. So it's, it's a more, far more traditional kind of critical editing project. For the database, it's, it's of course important this interconnection because maybe someone finds some document in Pittsburgh or I don't know where, but and you can add it to to the, to the database. So there, it's, it's important to fill in the gaps and have extra information, which I don't have. Yeah. Perhaps one short question. Not a this is very short and practical, but do either of these websites, Amy, give advice on how we should be citing the materials when we... <laughs> Um, yes, in fact, if you cite one of the letters, if you scroll all the way down, there is a link, uh, a site gives a citation. No. So thank them first. Well, yeah, I, was, well, I wasn't sure if I was supposed to thank them or you were supposed to. Please join me in thanking. Uh,